Okay, good morning. Today we're going to talk about DNA sequences, DNA polymerases, and PCR. I'm going to start by going over some features of the hemoglobin worksheet that we started last time, because there's a lot of confusion about that. Okay, it has to do with complementarity and just writing sequences. Okay, so here's the first two lines of our beta globin worksheet. And reminder, this is a cDNA. We're only given one strand, but the sequence is the same as an RNA would be, except for the substitutions of Ts for Us. So I've marked the ATG that starts translation. And if you had a copy of the genetic code, you could count off in groups of three to read what the actual amino acid sequence would be. Okay, I've also highlighted a T in one strand on the second line to indicate the position of the mutation in the sickle cell allele of this particular gene. Okay, so there's a lot more on the handout that we're not going to focus on right now. Okay, so what we're supposed to do is write a 20 mer oligo that will detect the nucleotide shown, the nucleotide being the T. Okay, so it's important to realize that there's actually two different 20 mer oligos you could use that, um, for this purpose because there's two strands in the DNA. And in a genomic DNA sample, it really doesn't matter which one you choose usually. Okay, we do want the um, T to be in the middle because that's analogous to the dot blot assay we use for the sickle cell allele, where the middle middle um, nucleotides will, if it's a mismatch, will destabilize the hybrid. So we're going to write a 20 mer that has that centers on that T um, that can detect that allele either in the RNA or the DNA. Well, in this case, in the DNA. Okay, so because both strands are present, it doesn't matter which one you pick. Okay, so for example, if I, the easy way to do this is just you're given the sequence, just write the complement of that sequence. So if, you, if that DNA sequence is present in the genomic DNA, um, which it will be, then simply complementing it will allow it to hybridize to that sequence if it's um, either in solution or bound to a filter the way it would be in that type of a blot. So that's certainly one way to answer the question. Right, the other way to answer the question is basically to realize that the other strand is also present. So you could use that exact sequence, just copy that sequence out again, because that actually will hybridize to the other strand, the top strand of the DNA. So either complementing it the easiest way, or what well, I think is easiest, or else just write out that sequence, realizing that that will um, hybridize to the complement. And that's because the DNA in the sample is actually double-stranded. Okay, so written this way, um, there's two possible products. Um, I've written this out in such a way that um, that second strand, at least, I wrote out manually complemented that lower strand to see what it will be. So all you need is an oligo that's going to bind to one strand or the other. It doesn't matter which. So there's two of them that can work. The one will hybridize to the bottom strand, has the same sequence as the upper strand, and the other one will hybridize to the upper strand, and it matches the lower strand. So when you're probing DNA from genomic double-stranded DNA, you can choose either oligo. It doesn't really matter. This is the same thing I just wrote. It will, this one will hybridize to the upper strand. The other will hybridize to the bottom one. So things get a little more complicated when you're trying to detect an RNA, an mRNA specifically in this case. Reminder about gene expression. The RNA's got a single strand, and it will match one of the strands in the DNA, but not both. So here you have to choose which oligo is going to work for you in order to bind the RNA. So reminder what a generic gene looks like. It's double-stranded, um, and we have a non-template strand and a template strand. When transcription occurs, the RNA polymerase will start copying the template strand, in this case the lower strand, and move off in a 5' to 3' direction on the RNA that's being synthesized. So I've diagrammed the RNA with its direction of transcription. Remember, it's going in a 5' to 3' direction on the molecule being synthesized. So that's what the RNA would look like, its strandedness. 
Okay, so taking into account the fact there's only one strand of the RNA, we can see what sequence it matches and which is complementary to, right? It, is been, it was made by copying by a base pairing process, the template strand, so it's complementary to the template strand. On the other hand, it is equal or equivalent to the non-template strand, because that's the one that is also complementary to the template strand. So we can read the RNA sequence from the non-template strand to see with the substitution of U's for T's, but realize that both the non-template strand and the RNA are complementary to the template strand. So you, if you wanted to detect an RNA, you want something that will hybridize to it, which is to say be complementary to it. And so you'd want an oligo that was part of the that, that was part of the template strand. So the, the template strand will be complementary to the RNA, and that's the oligo you would choose to, to actually detect that RNA in a solution or on a filter. Okay, so illustrating here, here is the non-template strand equivalent to the RNA, and then we can see what the nucleotides are with the boldface T in the middle, and you can see which oligo of the two I suggested before will hybridize to the RNA. It equals the template strand and is complementary to the RNA. The other oligo will not hybridize to the RNA because it's not complementary to it. It equals it, um, in this, or is equivalent to it. So it will be the same as it, it matches it, but it will not hybridize because it's not complementary. Oligonucleotides that are used to bind to the mRNA can also bind to the template or non-template strand of DNA. Oligonucleotides that are used to bind to the mRNA can also bind to the template strand of DNA. Okay. So this particular worksheet will be due on Friday by midnight, please. Okay. So we're moving on to talk a little bit about DNA synthesis in vitro because of the importance of PCR and DNA sequencing in molecular biology. And one thing to realize is that making DNA in vitro is much, much, much simpler than it is in a cell. In a cell, you don't have, you have replication forks, helicases, Okazaki fragments, sliding clamps, etc. But in a test tube, when we're trying to simply copy a little bit of a couple strands of DNA, we need to denature it. We don't need a helicase for that. We just heat it up. We need to have primers just like we do in cells, and we need DNA polymerases. But we don't need all the complicated machinery that's used to ac accurately replicate DNA in a cell. We will use DNA polymerases. They're usually bacterial ones, but they do have the same rules as far as polarity and nucleotides that they would have in, in, in vivo. Okay, so before we go on to PCR, I want to talk a little bit about the various DNA polymerases and their activities. Okay, so the defining characteristic of DNA polymerase, of course, is that they have five prime to three prime polymerase activity, which means that they're moving along a template, adding on to three prime ends and extending from the five, their own five prime end towards the three prime end. So everybody has that. But polymerases do differ in terms of other sorts of activities that they have. So I'd like to remind you a little bit about that. They can have three prime to five prime exonuclease activity. They can have five prime to three prime exonuclease activity, and they can have terminal transferase activity. And some polymerases have um, different, different versions of these, or different groups of these. All right. So in terms of the normal synthesis, the DNA strands are anti-parallel and they're, rel they're replicated in a five prime to three prime direction relative to the elongating strand, right? So that's the defining property of DNA polymerases. Okay. It uses deoxyribonucleotide triphosphates as substrates, requires a primer base pair to a template. DNA polymerases can't just start copying in the middle of nowhere. They need to add on to something, a pre-existing molecule base paired to a template. So here's a good old picture of what this looks like. It should look pretty familiar. Okay, so what we're showing here is a dark, partially double-stranded molecule. Um, the five prime end on, on the left is at the top, extending to its three prime end. 
with the 3 prime hydroxyl available for addition to that molecule. The template strand, of course, is anti-parallel to it. Its 3 prime end is at the top. Its 5 prime end is at the bottom. So the sugars are upside down relative to the other strand. So when polymerase is going to want to um, extend this strand, you have the primer, your pre-existing DNA to which you can add, your 3 prime hydroxyl, and you've also got a template with a, with a nucleotide sitting out waiting to be base paired. So we add the nucleotides, they were triphosphates at that point, they will form the phosphodiester bond with the 3 prime hydroxyl with the loss of the other two phosphates. So that extends the molecule, the pink serves as the primer, that ex extends the molecule to a growing 3 prime end. So then we can put in the C, and the C then will become incorporated into the molecule, as we see on the right-hand part of this slide. And that creates a new 3 prime end, which is the previously added C, and that allows the molecule to extend further by the incorporation of something complementary to the next nucleotide, which will be a G, right? So we have the, the very classic ex pre-existing molecule, which serves as a primer, base paired nicely to a template, which has some nucleotides that are ready um, to be copied. Okay, I think I said all this. It's important that the additions are sequential, one nucleotide at a time. That's going to become important for sequencing. So here's a little diagram of my own about what this looks like. This is highly representational. The little um, little line at the top shows that the bottom strand is base paired along the first part of its length. So that's going to serve as our primer. And there's a 3 prime hydroxyl available for addition to something that's complementary to the next nucleotide in the, in the template molecule. So in this case, it's going to be a G. So we're going to get a GTP. Um, from the world, and then we're going to create a phosphate, phosphodiester bond using that 3 prime OH on, this, on the previous sugar, and because the G is complementary to the C in the template. Okay, so once that happens, the molecule is one nucleotide longer, the 3 prime OH from the G is now available for further additions, and the complementary molecule in the template is an A, so the next nucleotide will be a TTP to match that A. And the process will continue stepwise until the um, whole molecule is completed. Okay, so there's our T, and then we'll eventually fill it out. Okay, so it's important that it's sequential that each new addition creates the 3 prime OH upon which the following addition can be made. Okay, so the other activities of DNA polymerases, um, which are characteristic of some but not all of these. In fact, the 3 prime terminal transferase is really quite unusual. Okay, so the first one's the 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease activity. And that's represented here. And that's also called proofreading. Okay, so this occurs at the replication fork when polymerase is extending the um, primer, really, um, to add new nucleotides to, to make a longer molecule. But in this instance, it's made a mistake. We have a C in the template and polymerase erroneously put in an A. So if you've got a proofreading activity, what you can do is basically undo the phosphodiester bond that you just made. So what's going to happen is the polymerase will stop and back up one step and, and chop that phosphodiester bond. Okay, and it's 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease. It's an exonuclease because it's starting on an end versus in the middle. Right, that 3 prime OH is the 3 prime end of that molecule, and it moves in a 5 prime direction. So the process of chopping out that A means the polymerase has to move towards the 5 prime end of the molecule that it's chopping. So that's why it's 3 prime, uh, three prime to 5 prime. So what happens once the recognition has been made, the 3 prime to 5 prime exo kicks in, cuts the phosphodiester bond that it just made, and then polymerase resumes moving in the correct direction with the addition of the correct G where it should have been in the first place. So that's 3 prime, 5 prime, exo, proofreading. Okay, so the importance of this, it keeps the genomic mutation rate down. Many DNA polymerases do not have proofreading activity. Um, one 
important example for people that work in labs is that the TAC DNA polymerase that's used for PCR reactions um, does not actually have proofreading activity. And as a result, when you get PCR products, there are mutations in them. So for a lot of applications, we choose a DNA polymerase um, that does not that does have proofreading activity, so there won't be quite so many mutants mutations in the PCR product. Sometimes that's more important than others. It's much slower, but it's much more accurate. Okay, proofreading involves the removal of nucleotides from the three prime end of the newly synthesized strand, five prime end of the newly synthesized strand, three prime end of the template strand. 3 prime end of the 5 prime end of the template strand. Well, it's 3 prime end of the newly synthesized. Okay, terminal transferase. TAC does this for some reason. It usually adds one non-templated A to the 3 prime ends of the molecule that is synthesized. Now, there are terminal transferases where that's what they do, but these are not strictly DNA polymerases because they don't use a template. So a standard terminal transferase is one that just adds nucleotides onto three prime ends, which is different from a DNA polymerase that happens to have terminal transferase activity. So our last activity is a five prime to three prime exonuclease. And this is used in cells for removal of RNA primers that are used for um, priming replication in cells and also in DNA repair. Okay, so the strands here are written in a kind of non-conventional way. Normally, the five prime to three prime strand is written on the top, and the, the three prime to five prime is written on the bottom. So don't get confused by this. It doesn't matter which way you do it, but you do have to pay attention to polarity in, time, in terms of trying to figure out um, how this nuclease is working. Okay, so what's represented here is a NIC in a DNA strand, newly synthesized, and the red thing is a primer, which needs to be removed. So the way a five prime to three prime exo often works, usually works, is that it reaches this position, sees the NIC, and then successively chops out nucleotides from the RNA primer, replacing that with the DNA as it goes along. So it's the five prime to three prime exo, because it's starting at an N, which in this case is a NIC, which is to say a discontinuity in the phosphodiester backbone, simply a broken phosphodiester bond and then successively moves 5 prime to 3 prime, and that's the 5 prime to 3 prime exo activity. But at the same time, it's a DNA polymerase, so it's filling in with um, deoxyribonucleotides as it goes along. So it's replacing the RNA with DNA in essence. But sort of as an aside right now, DNA polymerases don't seal NICs. All they can do is move the, the NIC down the molecule, even though you've replaced it with DNA, which is what you're trying to do. Um, you actually need DNA ligase to seal the NIC. So its basic function is in primer, primer removal, but also functions in some types of DNA repair. Okay, a polymerase that lacks 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease activity will not be able to remove primers, will not be able to correct errors at the replication fork, will create non-templated A's at the ends. A and B are true, A, B, and C are true. Answer B. Good. Okay, so we're going to start on examples of in vitro DNA synthesis reactions. The first one being PCR, and then the second one next time will be Sanger DNA sequencing. Now, PCR behaves according to the normal rules of DNA polymerases, since it's going to use naturally occurring, well, maybe mutant, but none, nonetheless naturally occurring DNA polymerases. You need a primer and a template, and you need deoxy ribonucleotide triphosphates. Okay, so if PCR involves, or its intent is to make a lot of a particular DNA sequence, and it doesn't just go over each strand once the way you would in standard in vivo DNA replication. Instead, it undergoes repeated rounds of DNA synthesis, so you get multiple, multiple copies of, of what you're synthesizing over the course of these many, usually about 30 or so reactions. Yeah, the other thing that's very important is it's selective. PCR will only synthesize um, DNA in response to a primer that's bound to a template. So we have to decide what primer we're going to use in order to select the region to be copied. So if that's the only region in the DNA 
that binds the primer, that would be the only region that's synthesized. The polymerase will ignore the rest because it needs to have a primer. So the choice of primer determines what DNA is to be copied or amplified in a PCR reaction. Okay, and it also involves cycling among different temperatures for reasons that we will see. Okay, so here's a diagram of a PCR reaction in a very simple form. Um, and this is a little bit um, misleading in a sense in that it makes it look like somebody's standing there adding primers at each step and adding DNA polymerase. And that's not true. The components of the reaction mixture are all mixed in together in a thermal cycler, which does all the heating and cooling for us. Okay, but the point of this is we have a double-stranded DNA that we want to amplify, a region within that double-stranded DNA. And the first step involves heating the strands to separate them so that then we can have material that's available for primers and polymerase to get at it. So that's done at 94 degrees, which is going to denature pretty much everything. Then the reaction mixture is cooled down, and the primers are going to hybridize to the chosen location on the two strands of DNA. Okay, now there are two primers, one for each strand, each complementary to a portion of, of their strand. And they're, of course, different from each other because they bind at different locations along the molecule. So hybridization is typically done at 55 or so degrees because these are short, they're 20 or so nucleotides, so they can't stand the high temperature. So you want a temperature at which they can stably hybridize and prime replication. And of course, you have to have a DNA polymerase and you've got to have your deoxyribonucleotide triphosphates. Okay, so once we're happy that the primers have hybridized, the reaction is heated up to a certain extent because the polymerases that are used for this are very heat stable. They have to be able to survive the 94 degree denaturation step, but they also themselves have a very high temperature at which they prefer to work. For TAC, it's 72 degrees centigrade, which is pretty warm, and but for others, it can be slightly lower than that. So that's our extension reaction where the primers that are bound to the template then acquire the DNTPs from the solution and extend the template to make the first strand. Both strands are synthesized. You need two primers, one for each strand. So the denaturation is usually done around 94. The uh, annealing varies somewhat, but around 55 is sort of standard. 72 degree extension, and then repeat the cycle. Because each round doesn't give you a huge amplification, it doesn't give you any amplification at all. It only creates one set of complementary strands. We have to have repeated um, cycles of denaturing, etc., to create the amplification effect of PCR. Okay, so this gives a nice, somewhat of an idea what this is about. You have your very first beginning. He, you heat and you denature, and the other primers extend. So you've created new molecules. And then you repeat the process. Heat, allow the primers to anneal, allow the primers to extend. Heat, allow the primers to anneal, allow the primers to extend. So each time you double the amount of DNA that's present in there, essentially, because the first round gives you two new strands where you had two for a total of four. And then again, you double and you double. Okay, so the chain reaction part of polymerase chain reaction has to do with the fact that you started off with a small number of template molecules, and then you create um, your, your PCR products, which then themselves serve as templates in the reaction. So if you just did it once, you wouldn't have amplification. What's important here is that once you create a new strand and repeat the cycle again, those new strands are templates to create more strands. And their, strand, their new strands are templates. So you have an overwhelming um, chain reaction or amplification as a result of that fact. And the other thing is that because after the first couple of cycles, um, everybody begins and, or ends with a primer. And so the pro, um, product that you eventually produce goes from the five prime end of one primer to the five prime end of the other primer. So you pr produce this defined product based on the location of the primer binding sequences in the original template. So this defined product is what eventually takes over the reaction. And that's the only thing you'll see on your gel if you run the products out when it's done.
So at the end, the two strands are complementary to, to each other, fully base paired. The primers are part of the product because they're the beginning part to which polymerase added, so they are part of the product. And they're all the same sequence as each other, except for whatever mutations may have occurred during the amplification process. Okay, thought experiment. How many new strands of DNA will be synthesized if we use one primer and perform the synthesis 30 times? How many new strands of DNA will be present if we use two primers, one at each end of the region of interest, and repeat the synthesis 30 times? Well, the answer to the first one is 30. If you have just one primer and you synthesize the strand 30 times, what you get is 30 strands because the um, t new molecules don't end up serving as templates for the next round. You just get what you see is what you get, 30 strands. If you use two primers, one at each end, and repeat the synthesis 30 times, you get about a billion molecules. And the reason is about what I said, that as soon as you make those initial products, they serve as templates, and their products serve as templates, etc., up to approximately a billion. Not that I don't think we actually get a billion, but in principle, if you do 30 cycles, 2 to the 30th is about a billion. So that's the chain reaction part. Oops, I think I just said that. So the important thing is that no new templates are made if you have only one primer. You need two, one for each strand to make both new strands. 